from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Well, welcome to U.S. Farm Report. We're back in the studios this weekend, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. The Mississippi River is now at a record low, posing problems for moving grain this harvest. I think it's had a bigger impact on the soybean market and soybean cash prices uh, basis bids, especially if uh, you're near the river and, and you've got river delivery locations. Uh, that's where it's been the worst. As harvest in areas like South Dakota have been quick, we'll get a check of yields from the field in an I-80 harvest update. The Biden administration is tapping into oil reserves, but the U.S. now only has 25 days of diesel supplies left. Looking to flip your soils? We may just have a recipe for success. And in John's world. Everybody is building a chip fab. Well, a lot of news to get to this weekend. The Mississippi River in Memphis now sets at the lowest level ever. The National Weather Service reporting it's a negative 10.75. This means the level is below the agreed upon zero level. The previous low record was set back in 1988. And because of the low levels, companies are not loading as much cargo onto ships, and that includes agricultural products so that they can travel safely and not bottom out. Now, according to the American Commercial Barge Line, the industry has also agreed to a 25 barge tow max size. That's a maximum of 38 percent reduction in capacity. And another river has reached its lowest point. The Platte River has reportedly dried up completely in parts of central Nebraska. Just look at these images. August and September, those were extremely dry months for the state with just about an inch and a half of rain falling in Lincoln. That's the least amount of rain for that stretch since 1894. 98% of the state remains in some sort of drought with over a third in the extreme or worse category. And farther west, the Colorado River Basin, which irrigates much of the southwest, is currently weathering the effects of the mega drought. A new study says the mega drought has broken yet another record, according to research published in the science journal Nature, from 2000 to this year, the drought has marked the driest period in the southwest since at least 800 A.D. The study goes on to say the drought will likely persist through this year, matching the duration of the mega drought of the late 1500s. Well, we're now starting to get an idea of the price tag of agricultural losses due to the recent hurricane. We're hearing as much as a billion and a half dollars in ag may have been lost in Florida due to Hurricane Ian. The University of Florida releasing its preliminary report saying over 1.2 million acres of agricultural land was impacted by the high-end Category 4 storm. The report says even though the Florida coast bore some of the worst impacts of the storm, the strong winds and rain battered a wide area of the peninsula. They're reporting citrus crop losses up to $304 million, depending on the level of fruit drop and damage to branches as well as other impacts. But the entire state's impact is more like 375,000 acres of citrus that was damaged. Vegetables and melons up to $394 million. Livestock operations and producers of animal products, those are expected to suffer losses of up to $222 million. We're hearing some very high percentages being reported in the news. It's not completely devastating to the entire um, agriculture industry in the state. That does not mean that individual operations won't have um, very different impacts, gets on, on par with or will potentially be similar to what we experienced with Hurricane Irma. However, court says they don't have good information yet on the depth and duration of flooding, so their damage assessment actually could go up. Well, gasoline prices are on the rise again. That's as the Biden administration is announcing some additional steps that the administration says they hope will help relieve some of that price pain. The Biden administration hopes the move will help bring costs down, but also soften the recent production cuts announced by OPEC plus nations. The president announcing plans to release another 15 million barrels of oil from the U.S. Strategic Reserve. The White House says this would meet his promise to release a total of 180 million barrels over six months. The administration also detailing a new strategy for eventually buying oil to replenish the stockpile, saying it would aim to do so when prices are at $70 a barrel. But some critics say that move could come at a cost. That's as diesel supplies currently set at only 25 days worth. The Biden administration calling it unacceptably low. Retail prices are on the rise again the past two weeks for diesel, but that 
is as diesel demand is surging. As government data revealed this week that supplies remain at the lowest season level ever. The shortage of heat and trucking is a key worry for the Biden administration. Well, the administration also making an announcement this week of helping some who are falling behind on farm loan repayment. USDA announcing a program to provide $1.3 billion in debt relief to about 36,000 farmers. The program is funded through the Inflation Reduction Act. The money allocated toward assisting distressed borrowers of direct or guaranteed loan administered by USDA. The agency carries loans and loan guarantees for about 115,000 farm borrowers who cannot get credit elsewhere. 11,000 of those have been at least 60 days behind on payments. To give those 11,000 borrowers the peace of mind that they don't have to be concerned or worried about the possibility of foreclosure. The money announced this week is the first round of payments designed to help farmers hit by pandemic-induced market disruptions or climate-driven natural disasters, including drought, to stay in business or also to re-enter farming. That's it for the news. Well, those low river levels that we talked about along the Mississippi, Coming up next, we have a video that really you will not believe until you see it as we also check in with Matt Urasavik to see if any rain relief is in sight. Please stay with us. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. The new 6180 Power Spread Manure Spreader from H&S is the heaviest built spreader in its size. This 800 bushel manure spreader includes a monoblock gearbox and rubber tongue suspension. Find out more at the H&S website. So right now we're standing in the middle of what is the Mississippi River. Well, check out this TikTok video captured by Nate Eversole. We talked about the low river levels in news, but right here you can see he's walking across what should be the Mississippi River in Rosedale, Mississippi. You can hear the sand crunching under his feet where that river should be just absolutely unbelievable. Matt, I mean, you look at these low river levels. I mean, it is apparent that we need more than just a couple rain events to help replenish these low river levels. But do you see a change in the weather pattern coming anytime soon? That's right, Ty. And we are going to see a pattern shift this week. That's going to bring some more rain to the middle of the country. Much, much needed. May delay harvest a little bit, but it is needed because look at this. Drought conditions continuing to expand eastward into the southeast, into the mid-south, and the Great Lakes and upper Midwest. And still looking at extreme to exceptional drought conditions all the way through Oklahoma, parts of Kansas, and even up into Nebraska and some of the southern Dakotas there as well. Still very, very dry. But take a look at this as we head into Monday. Big pattern shift. Now the cooler air is coming into the west, warmer air in the east, and that right there is going to create the chance for some rain, maybe some mountain snow or snow up into southern Canada there with the colder air on the backside of that system. And then through the second half of the week, Take a look at this, another dip in the jet stream. That's going to bring another system through the middle of the country. That's going to bring some more rain even farther to the south and into the southeast and even the Ohio Valley along with that. That lasts all the way into the weekend before things will start to settle down, but it looks like more systems could be on the way. Here's a look at Monday. That's one, the first system here moving right through the middle of the country. A couple of cold fronts bringing some showers and some storms. Colder air on the backside. You can see snow in the Rockies there. More rain moving into the Pacific Northwest, staying cooler behind the front, but very warm out ahead of it. Still warm off into the East Coast by Wednesday as that system slowly moving eastward. Behind it, cooler, mile down into the south. Lots of sunshine with high pressure and control, but another system beginning to move into the Pacific Northwest, bringing mountain snow and some rainfall there, which could be heavy at times. That next system by Friday across the middle part of the country, bringing rain all the way from the Gulf Coast up into the Great Lakes. Maybe some snowflakes mixing in there for portions of Michigan, Wisconsin, and then up into Canada. And a big temperature swing again coming. That's going to push the very mild air off the coast off the coast as that system moves on through cooler air coming in on the backside as well. And that's why this is what we've got for our temperatures this week above normal in the east right through the Mississippi and back to the west. That's where we're going to be looking at temperatures below normal. Couple of cooler systems, big pattern shift heading through this week and 
Much of the same with the precipitation. We'll see much above normal there in the northwest and more coming out into the northern Rockies as well. Below normal where we've seen a lot over the past few weeks and then a lot more where we really need it the most. That's where things have expanded with those drought conditions and take a look at temperatures next week. Still below normal in parts of the Rockies and the southwest staying above normal for a good portion of the eastern half of the United States and then the precipitation it's going to be much of the same above normal in the west and across the east coast and below normal right through the middle part of the country something that will continue to track right here on the U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Matt. Well, the dry weather has definitely helped harvest progress this year, but over the past couple weeks, we've seen basis change significantly in some areas. Why is that change happening? Well, Joe Vaklovic and Bob Utterback will provide some insight in our marketing roundtable snacks. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. We're in the studio for a change. Joe Vaklovic and Bob Utterback joining us. Joe, when we look at prices this week, saw some down days. Thursday saw prices, see a little bit of momentum. Is it just based on excitement about the export sales or were there, were there some other factors at, at play? I think the export sales in soybeans are a positive factor. We're finally seeing a return to some more Chinese buying. We saw some flash sales reported last week. We saw a good weekly number on Thursday morning. That's part of it. Uh, the other thing that could have driven the soybean market is option expiration. A lot of times uh, before a big option expiration, like this November option expiration that happened on Friday, uh, you'll see the market revert to or gravitate towards one of these big round numbers. And we saw a little bit of that with, with the $14 strike price and that big round number. So definitely some, some positive short term. Bigger picture, the markets have been choppy. I mean, corn's been kind of sideways, corn futures at least. Uh, soybean futures have been choppy to lower. Wheat's been kind of choppy to lower. So it's been kind of a, an unexciting trade relative to some of the things we've seen in recent months, I guess. Yeah, Bob, I mean, it's not like there's a lot of news events that hit this week. It seems like we're just still trading the same supply and demand factors as well as some of the things with the outside market. Has anything changed from your standpoint? Not really too much. I think the biggest change is that we've had such a beautiful harvest. Guys are actually tired and they want to take a break, but the harvest is great. And so the combines are breaking down a little too much, but uh, uh, the crop is coming out quickly. The yields, I think, are surprisingly better than what we thought was, was as bad as it is. And that's, I think, was why the market was weak the first part of the week, because it is October and this is the time of seasonal lows. But I would argue that once the, we get past harvest, maybe 75, 80 percent done, the bin doors start to shut, we'll bounce back up relatively quickly. But then we'll be back to the same old problem. We've got too much. We got supply in the bin. Is demand going to be strong enough to push the market any higher? And I think we got a long time period of sideways trading, uh, established overhead resistance, good floors until we have new fundamentals, which would have to be South American crop conditions and then into our spring. So I think over the next six months, the bears got to be cautious. The bull is probably going to be more of a bullish market. But as we all know, eventually the bull always kills the market and the bear has to be ready to take advantage of that opportunity. Well, we before we explore that demand side, when you look at basis and you look at, at locally in some of these areas, Joe, harvest has been pretty uneventful. Not a lot of rain delays. Farmers need a break, but so does the supply chain, it seems. I know in some areas, Joe, you can't even take grain to the local elevator right now. They're full in some of those bigger terminal areas. They're not taking grain. Is it all because of logistics? Are we seeing that big of a backlog? Is it mainly because of the river? Or is this just a different harvest because we haven't had a lot of breaks? Uh, it's it's different for a lot of reasons versus a normal year. So the difference in like crop production and say, parts of Illinois versus say parts of the Western Corn Belt. There's a huge difference there. In parts of Illinois, they had record corn and soybean yields in the Western Corn Belt. It's a disaster in some areas. So that's gonna affect the basis. There's gonna be a big difference from you know the good places to the bad places. The river issue is the other thing that's really obvious. I think that's had a big time negative impact on basis in some areas, especially in regard to soybeans. Uh, exports uh, represent a much larger portion of our demand base for soybeans. It's like half the demand base. Where in corn, it's only like 15%, give or take. So I think it's had a bigger impact on the soybean market and soybean cash prices, uh, basis bids, especially if uh, you're near the river and, and you've got river delivery locations. Uh, that's where it's been the worst. All right. Well, what about outside markets? And also, what about demand? We'll talk to Joe and Bob about that coming up later on U.S. Farm Report. But stay with us right now. We need to take a quick break. 
Well, some truck manufacturers have actually started shipping new trucks without the chips. So is there a solution when it comes to that semiconductor chip shortage that John has been talking about on the show? He joins us for John's World this week. Although U.S. Ag is trying hard to look the other way, tensions between the U.S. and China are escalating. I have talked perhaps too often about facets of this situation, but that's never stopped me before, so let's talk some more. The biggest development recently in our simmering feud has been our resentment, along with the rest of the world, of our dependence on China's manufacturing dominance. Now that they've begun to move toward producing not just consumer goods, but cutting edge technology, we have noticed we really aren't in a strong bargaining position. Our government, along with other China competitors, notably our allies, South Korea and Taiwan, are matching our steps to lower our dependence on all things Chinese. It's going to be a challenge. The headline grabber in this competition is semiconductors, or chips. Now, if you remember this uh, illustration from April 21st, this is a, uh, shows where chips actually come from, how the process. The first step, which is not clearly shown, is to actually design the semiconductor. The U.S. is the overwhelmingly dominant global player in this architectural type step. But then we hit a block on our pipeline. Outside of the semiconductor giant Intel, we have very little fabrication capacity. Like the rest of the world, we have relied upon, with good reason, partners TSMC and Samsung, who produce about 90% of all the chips in the world. However, pressure from industry and political sources has prompted plants to build domestic fabrication plants. New plants have been announced in Texas, New Mexico, New York, Arizona, and an enormous fab in Ohio. Meanwhile, China has responded by rapid expansion of their foundry capacity. The Inflation Reduction Act provided around $200 billion to make this happen. Now, personally, I'm a little skeptical of the completion dates. Remember Foxconn in Wisconsin, for example? But regardless of whatever gets built or not, this global frenzy to build chip fabs has some big challenges to overcome. Before the pandemic and supply chain meltdown, there was strong demand for semiconductor, but few outright shortages of any size. Supply and demand were roughly balanced. The planned facilities may reduce our dependence on foreign suppliers, but they could also flood the market just as the global economy's edge towards recession, crimping consumption. Now, I'll, I will detail some of the possible problems next week, along with some of the possible outcomes and what it means for farmers. Well, as John mentioned, he will dig into that topic a little bit more next week. But if you would like to hear more of John's commentary, you can just check out that QR code on your screen. All right, when we come back, tractor that does not need a semiconductor chip. We have Tractor Tales with Machinery Peak next. Hey folks, welcome back to Tractor Tales. This week we're in Hobbs, Maryland, and we're here with Bill Tower. And Bill, you've got something pretty special here. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, we finally bought a Waterloo boy. I never thought I'd ever be able to own one. You but we it. bought it at a sale in Boaz, Kentucky in November the 4th. There was a Joe Ben Wilson auction, and we bought it there, and I'm happy with it. Have you had it home here for a little while? or just We've had it? it home here since the first part of November. We had it in five Christmas parades, and uh, we, we've got to get it painted, but it's in good shape. It You've runs. been busy. Yeah. And now, in particular, the Waterloo Boy Bill with, with the 100-year anniversary, was that important to you when you were buying it? Did that mean something? Yeah, it did, but it was just the fact that I had the opportunity to buy Waterloo Boy. I've always wanted one, and now I own one. Now, you say always wanted one. You, I understand, Bill, just began collecting what? 2004. Okay. And that's when I started reading the history of John Deere and realized that the Waterloo Boy was the foundation of the two-cylinder engines. Okay. My mother always said the first words I ever spoke was John Deere. <laughs> Well, why do, you, why do you suppose, Bill? What was it about John Deere that always... I just like the sound of the old John Deere's. Uh, going into the auction, were you determined to get it at any price, or did you have a... No, I had a limit, and they about reached it. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you, how did you feel when you got it home and got to see it in person here? I, I was just elated. I was happy. And you were saying the Waterloo Boy was 
was one you'd always had your eye on wanting to add to the collection? I always wanted to add one to the collection, never thought I'd be able, be able to. What kind of reaction do you get when people see it? We've had a lot of reaction to it, and uh, we actually, out of five praise, we won four first place trophies with it. Wow, four blue ribbons in two months, that's pretty good, yeah. uh, pretty good stuff. Yeah. Well, some areas of the country are reporting yields this harvest that are better than what they thought. However, other areas that are seeing drought rob yields as well as test weights this year. So we're off on an IED harvest tour with Michelle Rook as she takes us to South Dakota next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. The I-80 Harvest Tour is brought to you exclusively by Case IH. Case IH equipment is designed, engineered, and built by farmers. See their stories at BuiltByFarmers.com. Welcome back. Well, the dry weather in South Dakota is pushing harvest near record pace right now, with 82% of the soybeans and 44% of the corn out of the field. However, as Michelle Rook reports this weekend in our IED Harvest Tour kickoff, it's also because there's fewer bushels to handle in areas that were hit by drought. The theme this harvest season here in South Dakota is variability, with great differences in yield and moisture from north to south. In the Northeast, many farmers had excess moisture this spring and took prevent plant on some acres. The exception was Chad Schooley. We had a good start this spring. We were, we were lucky right here. We got in on time. Rains through July benefited his corn, and even with the heat, yields are only down slightly from farm averages. We're probably going to be in that 175, 180. We'd like to see closer to 200, so about 10% off. And the quality of the corn is good with test weights in the upper 50s. However, he ran out of moisture in August, which hurt his early beans. The better beans are 50 to 60, but our early beans were, you know, 20, 30, a lot of 40s. So I'm hoping to average in the 40s. A little farther south, David Iverson's soybeans are short, but yields in the 40s and 50s will exceed 2021. We had more rain this year uh, on most of our fields, so I think uh, our yields are going to be better than last year. And his corn crop is right on his APH. Our goal for corn is to have 200 bushel in our area, and I think we'll be in that, in that neighborhood. Jesse King farms near Iverson and says surprisingly, he's getting average to above average soybean yields. On the lighter ground, high 40s. Um, this field here uh, was mid 50s. We had a 60. But in the southeast, farmers have been hit by drought conditions that are similar to 2012. We were 11 and a half inches behind normal for the growing season. That uh, wasn't just for the whole year, but that's pretty significant because that would be um, less than half. And for Tim Ostrom, his dryland corn yields will be half of normal. It's, it's really a tough year. Just no rain, hardly at all. So this field right here that we're in is going 90. His bean yields were also disappointing, running on either side of 30 bushels per acre. And all the beans are very short. I mean, the yields are not going to be very good in our part of the state. Overall in South Dakota, it doesn't look like the North will make up for the South. I don't see that. I think if North, if we're average or some places a little above average, um, but if uh, the South is uh, pretty much below average, I think overall we'll uh, be down some. Fortunately though, basis levels and cash grain prices have stayed strong to offset losses. Prices right now, you know, are some of the highest prices that I've sold in my farming career so far. There's six and a half dollar corn going to town right now at 180 bushel. That, uh, that's still good money. I'm Michelle Brook for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. Well, we talked about harvest in our round tables, but is demand starting to crumble at all? Joe Vaklovic and Bob Aderbeck rejoin me next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Joe Vaklovic and Bob Utterback joining us again. Joe, when you look at the demand side, got some positive numbers when it comes to things like soybean demand. Uh, still seeing strong demand fairly on, on the meats, but as you look at this strong U.S. dollar, are there any red flags that you're watching from the demand standpoint? 
Um, I think the dollar is different this year than it has been in the past. So typically strong dollar is bad for commodities, right? Well, the whole like first six months of the year, the dollar rallied and commodities rallied simultaneously. I just don't know if I see the relationship this year. This is such a unique situation. The dollar's rallying because we're raising interest rates faster than anybody else is in the world. Um, is, is it negatively impacting exports to some extent? Maybe. But I don't know that it's like the make all be all force that uh, maybe we thought it was prior uh, to this whole mess that started with COVID back in 2020. I mean, it's just it's it's like a different world now. I just I'm not reading as much into it as maybe I would have been three years ago, I guess. Bob, do you agree with what Joe just said? I think he's got some merit to what he's saying, but also I think the Ukrainian Russian conflict getting more intense is is probably adding to that anxiety of everybody in the global wanting to control a product. And they're they're saying, I want to get it regardless of the dollar, but eventually the strong dollar is going to come in and bite us pretty hard as you get out there in 23, 24. And so that's one of be the real challenge for everybody is, you know, paying these high prices for land, high cash rents, all the expenses come into the farmer. Farmers are going to say, hey, I now need five fifty six dollars is at what time does this uh, come in, in these higher interest rates and the high dollar really come in and start to have negative effect? And I think it'll be latter part of 23, uh, latter part of next year before we really come back to a normal type market. So, yeah, we're in a strange time period. And strange times things make strange bedfellows, but I would long term not want to discount the impact of the strong dollar on exports. Just for this year, he's probably correct. Well, on the livestock side of things, though, Joe, at the same time, we have these declining numbers. Right now, does USDA, do you do you feel like USDA has figured in how small this cattle herd is here in the U.S.? I think um, people, people in the cattle business are waiting for USDA to reveal just how light the numbers are going to ultimately be. Uh, the market's already discounted this to some extent, to some extent, I don't know to what extent, you've got big premiums in the deferred contracts when you get out to 2023. And the board actually perked up quite a bit this week as did cash. So, I mean, it's it's a market that's got a really good story, I think. It looks like the boxed beef market's bottomed, at least for the moment. So it, it does have a good story. Uh, when is that story uh, like on paper? Uh, when does USDA print it? I, I don't know exactly, but it's out there. It's it's inevitable, I think, at this point. Bob, you mentioned, mentioned interest rates, but looking at the outside markets this week, looking at the action that, that, that it had, do you feel like the outside markets do think that we're going to continue to see a Fed rate hike? Is that guaranteed? I think it is. And, you know, I've heard stories of the food prices people are paying at the food counter increasing significantly. And I think that's going to be one of the impacts. Yes, cattle and hogs, I've been bullish because of the supply side. My anxiety is if this summer we have a cold winter and we start having high heat bills with high fuel prices, consumers are going to have to make hard choices between rent, gas for the car, fuel for the house. And I think that means they'll change their taste and preferences for the meats and go to the lighter cut meats and away from beef and pork and more to chicken. And so that's... So it is, it's, again, it's a different time period. Some of the old rules don't apply, but I think we got to watch the consumer demand and the general economy. And I think the Fed, I hope we don't do what we did in 1978 through 1981, where the Fed moved slowly, increasing interest rates, and then realized they had to really hit the pedal to the metal and had to really crush it when Volcker came in. And that's my biggest anxiety, is that they don't move fast enough on interest rates to slow down the economy and all of a sudden, it doesn't come back under control. And if we have seven, half, eight percent in the next two months, I think after the post-election, midterm elections, we could see a significant increase in interest rates through first half of next year, which almost guarantees a recession in the last half of 2022 and 23. Excuse okay, me. Joe. Joe, real quick, recession though. I mean, we've talked about recession. We've seen the impact that it can have on commodity markets. But do you think there is a lot of downside risk still if that happens? Yeah, commodity markets hate recessions. I'm actually really impressed with how well uh, the corn markets acted, the soybean markets acted, the wheat markets acted. This could be a lot worse. I mean, we've we've seen uh, big downdrafts in the stock market like this before, and it doesn't happen often. But sometimes, you know, commodities will go along with it. We've seen crude oil really back off, and crude oil is kind of like 
as far as I'm concerned, kind of like the bus driver of, com of the commodity markets in general. But these grain markets are, are really sticky. I mean, this corn market in particular, you're still sitting like just south of seven bucks, smack dab in the middle of harvest, staring recession in the face. I mean, that's a really impressive action uh, when you really think about a grand scheme of things. Well, Bob, we still have a rail strike possibility. That's a lingering coming up uh, in, in mid-November. So as you look from a farmer's standpoint, as they're harvesting on areas that they're not able to accept grain or areas that you're seeing bases just crumble, what is your advice for farmers? Well, you know, coming into August, September, I was proposing that you guys should dump it off the combine because the market was giving some premium bids. Now with the bases starting to decline, guys are getting less excited about moving the product. There's limited carry in the market, but uh, it's getting to a, a really difficult decision because the basis has dropped. So for a lot of the guys, uh, it's probably got the grain's going to go in the bin. It's going to sit there to about November, December, and then they're going to evaluate the landscape and decide, do they want to move it? I still think uh, if you have a very limited carrying charge market and a good basis in that December time period, I would rather dump the inventory and put on a limited option play, keeping your risk on paper rather than storing for six months, hoping for that summer weather scare from the Western come into the Eastern Corn Belt and hoping the market explodes and pays you off. Because, you know, this year spoiled a lot of guys. We had some big corn bases in the Midwest, 150 to 180 over. And that lingering um, con concern that that might could happen again, I think is going to motivate a lot of people to store a lot of corn all the way to next July, August. And if we don't have a weather problems, they're going to get caught uh, back to a normal seasonal basis behavior that could be quite uh, disarming for them. All right, Bob, Joe, thank you for joining us this weekend. We need to take a quick break and then we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Smart Nutrition MAP plus MST. Experience the latest, most efficient system for delivering sulfur and phosphate to meet your crop's needs with Smart Nutrition MAP plus MST. Learn more at smartnutritionmst.com. Well, soil health is a key ingredient in achieving higher yields, but just what can be done to improve the health of your soil? Well, Michelle Rook rejoins us this weekend as she digs into the recipe for flipping your soil. Conservation is farming in southwest Nebraska. That mindset is a necessity for farmer Tracy Zink. Moisture is typically scarce where she farms near Indianola, Nebraska, so it's essential she preserve every drop. She accomplishes that by disturbing the soil as little as possible, even for weed control. For the most part, all of our dry land, we try very hard to be no-till. Uh, if weeds get away from us or they're resistant, we try to only do the spot where the resistance is. No-till practices have improved organic matter and soil health, which help keeps even heavy rains from running off and eroding the soil. Plus, she says they leave as much crop residue intact after harvest as possible. So the other things we do with our soil is we, we try to have always have residue on the top to help protect it from blowing. When I think about soil quality, it's also that it stays put. Crop rotations are also important, and on irrigated acres, it includes two seasons of corn followed by soybeans. Zink says the dryland rotations are even more diverse, but depend on moisture levels. We uh, always do wheat, hard red winter wheat. That is our, our base for the next crop. So following that, half of our wheat acres go to milo, half of our wheat acres go to corn. And then the following year, they become corn or milo. The year following is typically summer fallow. Now Zinc does annual soil testing to set a baseline for fertility. And with the arid environment, she says she has to strike a balance between yield and conservation. I don't look for home runs in yield because I don't have the water for it. So I already have to have that conservation set for my yield goals. Every practice Zinc incorporates on her farm must fit into her holistic approach to conservation because she wants to continue the work her grandparents started. As you look out and around, none of this would be possible if we weren't incredibly mindful about proper stewardship of soil conservation, managing what the wind and water erosion can do to it. And by improving soil health, she knows her farm will also be sustainable for years to come. I'm Michelle Rook for U.S. Farm Report. Thank you so much, Michelle. All right, when we come back, customer support this weekend. An update and clarifications.
from Rural Broadband to the Keystone XL Pipeline. John Phipps is covering a lot of ground in customer support this weekend. Okay, today an update and some clarifications. First, we've been using our Starlink satellite here on our farm for broadband for about three weeks now, and I learned one important thing. Stop looking at the speed tests. For whatever reason, internet speed tests for our systems at least are all over the place. It's like fixating on the combine yield monitor this year. It's wildly variable, drive you nuts. That said, Starlink's performance with our computers and TVs is a huge improvement. The white spiral of death when the connection is slow and has to rebuffer when we're watching TV, along with occasional loss of resolution, is gone. The web is noticeably faster, especially downloading massive iOS upgrades. It is a legitimate answer to rural broadband. And now, from Jerome Kramer in Tyrone, Oklahoma, what's the reason the Keystone pipe hasn't been reopened instead of turning loose the oil reserve? Now, this is from some time ago. Well, this could be name confusion. The Keystone Pipeline has been running since completion in 2017 and was never shut down by the Biden administration. The Keystone XL was an addition to that pipeline and was only 8% completed after being started in 2008. It faced multiple lawsuits from farmers and ranchers and environmentalists, especially due to the proposed route through the Nebraska Sandhills. President Biden canceled the permit finally um, in 2021, he did not shut any pipeline down. It wasn't there. Many of us simply got sloppy and conflated the two pipelines by omitting the XL. Brent Wine, and I hope that's right, in Convoy, Ohio comments, you talked about how the current administration shutting down Keystone XL did not have an effect on oil prices because it wouldn't be up and running yet. However, even just the prospect of corn acres being down has driven the price of corn up. Shouldn't this logic apply to oil prices as well? Well, possibly, but the XL addition would have been added less than 1% to global oil production a minimum of two years from now. I can't see that creating much of a price reaction compared to the impact of, say, the Ukraine war, OPEC production, production decisions, surprisingly rapid Chinese EV adoption, and the very real threat of a global recession. At any rate, I'd take the opposite side of that futures bet. Thank you, John. Well, there's a new grant to help revitalize small towns. We travel the countryside with Andrew McRae next. The NRCS Conservation Stewardship Program cost shares more than 150 practices on farms and ranches. Visit your local service center or farmers.gov today. Well, T-Mobile may be known as a mobile telephone company with 5G, but thanks to a nationwide hometown grant effort, T-Mobile is helping revitalize small towns across the U.S. This weekend, we travel the countryside with Andrew McRae. The Courthouse Square in Chillicothe, Missouri, has been a special place for people to gather for more than a century. But over time, some of the structures along the north side of that space had seen better days. Buildings had to come down, but this spot was a perfect spot to put a pocket park in. As Pam Jarding mentions, those buildings were raised and a pocket park was developed in their place. The name has special meaning in this region of the state. The Silver Moon is a history of the longest standing business in uh, Chillicothe. Millbank Mills and Silver Moon Feeds can trace its lineage back to the days of the Civil War, which caused the business to move west, landing in Chillicothe in 1867. This little pocket park has become a nice gathering space for people in town and the area, whether it be for concerts, wine walks, weddings, and more. But additional work needed to be done to help this spot. So Pam and the local Main Street group submitted an application for a T-Mobile hometown grant. We felt that we needed additional seating. Silver Moon Plaza, we will be putting in um, an ADA compliant uh, we'll have two of those picnic tables. And so the benches will not only go 
around here, but they'll go throughout the district as well. Repairs will be made to the brick flower planters, plus other updates will take place to make the space more attractive and usable by all. Our merchants, we're very proud of the merchants because they're taking great pride here. We have a very low vacancy rate. I think T-Mobile understood what we were trying to do in a rural Missouri uh, community since Chilton Coffee. T-Mobile's hometown grant program is awarded to up to 100 communities each year, granting up to $50,000 to each. Judy says her town's mission and that of T-Mobile were a perfect fit for the program. We are here for smaller communities, small towns, and we want to help them thrive. I think that's what they want to do and what they want to strive for. This is a beautiful little pocket park, and thanks to this grant, they'll continue to be able to serve more events and more people in the surrounding area. In Chillicothe, Missouri, I'm Andrew McCray. You can also submit a proposal of your own by going to T-Mobile.com. Thanks again, Andrew. Well, you, we are on the road the next two weeks. We're off to K-State next week and then Mizzou the following week to wrap up our 2022 U.S. Farm Report College Roadshow with Bex. We're excited to attend both land-grant universities as we explore what research they have to offer. We hope that you'll join us as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.